Our text this morning is from the second, the closing letter of Timothy. These are the, really the closing reflections of the Apostle Paul. And he has been in the very midst of Nero. He's faced him and, and he did so alone. And now he's basically rotting in a Roman prison and he is abandoned. He's all alone. And he's writing to young Timothy who is carrying on his work in Ephesus and giving him some instructions as to what he should do. But he's, this letter of Paul's is not like a lot of the letters where he's writing to the whole church. This is sort of the unalloyed letter of one who is really laying it out there where, where, where Timothy in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, where Timothy can really understand what he's saying. That's a tough word, and yet it's a word that's full of passion and full of a sense of his being at the closing days of his life. He knows his end is coming. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he appears to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is for favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. As for me, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, and I've remained faithful. And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly forward, look forward to his appearing. Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Damas has deserted me because he loves things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, be sure to bring the coat I left with Carpus at Troas, and bring my books, especially my papers. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we said. The first time I was brought before the judge, no one came with me. Everyone abandoned me. But the Lord stood with me and gave me strength so that I might preach the good news in its entirety for all the Gentiles to hear. And he rescued me from certain death. Yes, the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Give my greetings to Priscilla and Aquila and those living in the household of Onesephorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus sends you greetings, as do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. May the Lord be with your spirit and may his grace be with all of you. May God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. So this morning I was brushing my teeth. I know you're glad that I do. But I was thinking about the fact that I brushed my teeth the same way all the time, without even thinking. I know you're supposed to do it for two minutes or something like that, but I, you know, mine is probably 45 seconds or something, but I, I, I was thinking about that. 
Now let me, let me have you do an experiment. Cross your arms. Now do it backwards, do it the other way. I, it's almost impossible to do. <laughs> we have our patterns. We have our ways of doing things. And we do all kinds of things without thinking. And those patterns that we enter into become so much of what we do in life. So this morning, rather than coming down Goodlett, I came down the trail. Sometimes I'll come down Livingston just to break it up a little bit. I still don't know how to change the way I brush my teeth, but I'll come up with something. But we have our patterns. And sometimes the best things in life can be when those patterns are broken. When we have to change the way we do things. God willing, it's not because something has been forced upon us. And that happens to all of us sooner or later in some way or another. But when we can stay open to different ways of behaving, which issues from different ways of thinking. Remember when I was in seminary, Every day at 4.30, I'd go to, the, uh, go to the gym and play handball. And um, nobody plays handball anymore, but it's, it's a great game, tough game. And uh, I'd play for about an hour and a half. And after playing, I would go to, the, go, to the, um, go to the dining hall and eat dinner around those round tables where we'd all argue theology and all of that sort of thing. And I sat down with one of the precept leaders, a PhD student who was leading one of the precepts in our theology class. And I got in an argument with him. And it, it was that he was telling me how collective farming in Russia was so much more the way to go than the way we were farming here in the United States. And I thought about this, and I, I was under this heavy influence of my theology professor and, and this particular teacher. And he was going on and on about this, but then I said, but you know, I read an article some time ago that American farmers went to the Ukraine and had a head-to-head -head competition with, with farming, and that the yield per acre of our farmers way exceeded that of the Russian farmers. And he said, well, <clears throat> yeah, but and then he went on to talk about fossil fuels and, and all of that sort of thing. But it just occurred to me that at that time I thought maybe I was becoming a bit of a Marxist in my thinking. And that argument began to break my thinking and my direction, my ideological direction at that point. Because here I am, I have used all this energy to play handball. And then I'm using all that intellectual energy to argue at the table. And then I'm eating the, this food, and, and there's no lack of food. And who am I to be receiving such goodness? And who am I to be expending such energy? In, in an ideal world, shouldn't all this be evened out? If there's real justice in the world, why would I be taking more than my share as one of, at that time, maybe four billion people on the planet? And I began to think that maybe, maybe my thinking has been wrong. Maybe my, my whole ideological framework at that point as a young freshman, first year student in seminary, was misguided. And then I began to think about other aspects of the faith about the giftedness that God gives to every individual, every human being, and the challenge that we have to, to exert those gifts and to make our contributions in life because of the gifts that God gave to us. So the pattern of my thinking changed dramatically. I think it's so critical that we always have and put ourselves in a place of opportunities to have our thinking shifted, to have our thinking changed, at least 
to be able to understand those who may think differently than we do. And in that, we find ourselves in a place where rather than simply repeating patterns day in and day out, we can always have a sense that there's an opportunity for us to live in a new way, to walk in a new way, and to have a new perspective, a new, a new way of looking at life. As I say, one of the best things that can happen to us is to be wrong and to find new ways of thinking and being. Now, the Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, he is surveying his life. He's looking back. And he is in a place where he's thinking over the realities of the number of times he's been arrested. He's been beaten. They tried to stone him twice. Thrown in jail a number of times. And he's in jail now. And he, he feels like he might be in an embarrassment to those around him because he's in jail. And He's wondering about the course of his days, wondering about the choices he's made. And here is young Timothy. Timothy may be something in the neighborhood of 30 years younger than Paul. Paul is probably in his mid-60s at about this time. And Timothy is the, the one who's coming up behind him. And what does Paul do but he tells him to do the important things? do the most important stuff with his life. And the emphasis is to preach the word. Timothy is in Ephesus where there's all kinds of wild, crazy thinking, all these Greek mythologies, and then on top of that, he's got the, the Jews who are opposing him, and then Jewish Christians who think that, that everyone has to become Jewish before they become Christian, all this stuff. And so he has the responsibility of trying to bring correction, trying to change people's minds, trying to change their patterns, trying to change the way that they, they live their lives by changing first and influencing the way they think. And the way they think then can issue in the way they behave. So that's the challenge that he has. And, and so in the midst of that kind of challenge, Paul simply says, just preach the word. Stay steady. Do the work that you're called to do. And those words are so fundamental and true, so basic. Stick to the fundamentals. I've shared this before about the ship's captain, merchant marine and known for his exploits in the midst of storms and gales. And, and there is a young mariner on his ship, and he is there to try to learn what this great sea captain did. Why is it that he was so good at what he did? And why was he lifted up as being such a pro? Well, there's a storm, huge gale, white out. And this young student, watch the captain leave the deck and left steering the ship to others, go down in the hallway into his cabin. He, he followed behind in the hallway in that as the captain went into the cabin. The captain closed the door partially. There was a little bit open. So this young student went up to the door as the captain went behind his desk and he watched in as that captain sat at his desk, opened the drawer and pulled out a piece of paper, started reading it out loud to himself. Port is left, starboard is right. <laughs> when it's tough, stick to the fundamentals. That was the message the Apostle Paul is giving to Timothy. It's tough. Think about what I've been through. Stick to the fundamentals. And when life is full, and when your years are full, 
And when your time has come, if you stick to the fundamentals, then you can look back and have no regrets. And the apostle knows that his day is drawing near. He will be executed. These are the closing words that we have from the Apostle Paul. His life will come to an end very soon. And what's so tough about this is that Paul, in prison, a condemned man, has been deserted. The friends are gone. Some of those so-called friends just thought it was too much. One thought, well, the way of the world is better than this. Almost anything is better than this. Here we followed Paul, and he's in prison. He's going, to get, he's going to get executed, have his head knocked off. Why would I want to do this? Why would I want to stick with him? Others just wanted to go off and get caught up in the thinking of the, of the day. One after another, and Paul is alone in the closing days of his life. And that becomes for us a reminder of how critical it is for all of us to support one another, that we not be alone. The apostle lived his life lived it vigorously, he lived it well. I don't know if you remember that, that photograph of Pete Rose diving into third base. He's horizontal <laughs> before he hits the base. That's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's giving all that he has. He's gone horizontal as he's heading for home. And he is encouraging Timothy to do the same, to live this life fully, vigorously, without reserve. Not that it will make friends and influence people, but that it will please God. And when we know of our brother and sister, who may be in that place where their lives are, are beginning to wane away. How critical it is that we be there with and for one another. That we, we acknowledge that in those alone days, I mean, what do people do when they're alone? They get up and they're alone all day. TV is not much of a friend. Family lives all over the place. And the day goes by, and maybe it's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in the middle of the day, but alone and, and isolated. And how critical for us to be aware of one another and the, the affliction of being alone and the consequent loneliness that comes with that, that we be there for one another. I was privileged, before we lost our dear brother Peter Thomas, I was privileged to be able to visit with him on a regular basis over a two-year period of time. Peter, who was still working at, at uh, almost 90 years old, stumbled forward on, on his way up to his studio where he was reading, and, and he fell forward onto his knees, broke both hips and vertebrae in his back, and it laid him up for the last two years of his life. But there at Moorings Park, when people would visit, he, he made them feel like they were so important he continued to do what he had done all of his life, and that is 
ennoble others. Let others know how important they were. Peter, who went into Normandy the day after, arrived to see the carnage on the beach, and after the experience of the Second World War, he had so much honor and respect for those men who had given their lives that he spent all of his days driving a jeep to honor them, to remember them. And in those closing days, he, he gave himself for others. And every now and then I'd come across somebody who was leaving, and they always had a bit of a smile on their face. And there was always some kind of a comment, what a man, what a man. When we spend our days, when we practice, when we develop the pattern of giving of ourselves, of extending our lives into with the lives of others, of recognizing the beauty, the magnificence, the, un the uniqueness of the other. When we give ourselves in that way, when that time comes where we face our own alone time, maybe it won't, won't be quite so lonely. Maybe the pattern that we have established will be such that we can look over the days of our lives and be grateful that we had an occasion to give of ourselves in so many ways. Otherwise, if we have looked at this world as a place for us to go out and get stuff, and people have been utilitarian aspects of our lives where we see a person and the idea is for us to get something from them, we will be very alone and live and die in isolation. So the apostle had Mark brought to him by Timothy. He had Luke with him. Even though he had been abandoned by so many, he had those into whose life he had really poured himself. And God willing, Timothy made it to Rome before, before Paul died. We don't know, but this we do know. We, without human affection, without human touch, without w the warmth that we can extend to one another, we will die and it will hurt and we will be alone. So the challenge for all of us is to always reach out, to speak, to, to love, and to touch so that we can know that wherever we are in life, we're not alone. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Father, these challenges that we face in this life are unavoidable. And therefore, while we have strength, while we have breath, while we have capability, may we be constantly scavenging for ways that we can show your love to another. Break our patterns that would keep us apart from and give us new patterns that extend us out toward. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ.